Well, this is a tough video to tackle. I planned it over a month ago, but then decades happened in weeks, which led me to puzzle over the best way to tell this story. Apartheid is a large and complex topic. In this video, I summarize several different movements and tactics, but ultimately, I have to gloss over a lot of important stories. But as we begin, I want to mention that this is a story of African indigenous people fighting the racist oppression of white supremacists. Like all racial struggles, the big fight is just the beginning, and the battle for racial justice in South Africa is still going today. Oh no, I, I made it political. I'm so, I'm so sorry. For everybody hitting the streets and making your voices heard to fight white supremacy, I am with you. Solidarity, all cops are bastards. From the first moment people of color lived on land or had bodies white people wanted to exploit, racism has been used to justify the theft of resources and labor. If you want to know the full history of South Africa, I made a video on that which you can watch here. For the sake of this video, apartheid's origins go all the way back to when South Africa was a Dutch colony. The Dutch colony practiced slavery, and when the British took over in 1806, they agreed to respect the local traditions of the land that they had come to. That is to say, continue to enslave the indigenous inhabitants. These laws included limits on indigenous people's movement and required they have permission slips to travel to different regions. Slavery ended in the British Empire in 1833, but that didn't change much in South Africa. As the Brits say, what oppression happens in the colonies stays in the colonies. Many indigenous Africans went from literal slavery to a form of indentured servitude which wasn't much different. South Africa was made up of several colonies at this point, and a patchwork of restrictions on indigenous people ruled the land. Even in the English Cape Colony, a colony with multiracial elections, restricted voting rights based on factors such as property or education. But they also limited how much land Africans could hold. During this time, strangely, very few people of color wound up being elected. Some places, like the South African Republic, had even more repressive laws. The South African Republic was a Dutch Afrikaans-speaking independent state later conquered by the British in the Second Boer War, and integrated into what would become South Africa. The laws here were even more repressive. In 1905, the black South African vote was revoked entirely. The requirement for Africans to carry travel passes never went away, and, at some point, Indians were required to carry them as well. Repression wasn't slowing down. In fact, Africans were prevented from going to certain areas at all. What we call South Africa today began in 1910 as a British dominion, like Australia or Canada. Think of it as diet independence. You get to manage yourself, but still maintain loyalty to the British crown. South Africa's founding documents enshrined white people's right to vote and banned non-whites from holding office. Beyond specific reserves, Africans were banned from buying land. As early as 1918, white people forced Africans into overcrowded zones, a foreshadowing of the horrors of the Bantustans, which we'll talk about later. The only way black Africans could live in white areas were in segregated communities, available only to those who provided cheap labor to white-owned businesses. As the world was embroiled in the Second World War, it seemed like these oppressive policies were softening. The ruling party at the time, the United Party, wanted to loosen restrictions, which I'm sure worked out perfectly. Just go into my script here. Uh, oh no. Oh no! The apartheid regime began in earnest after the 1948 election. White workers were overseas fighting the war, so South Africa needed an influx of non-white workers to fill in, especially in industrial areas. This led to a significant economic boom for these non-white workers. But no one had planned for this economic prosperity. When these people tried to use their new wealth to buy houses, the result was a housing crisis, which made the white people panic. Swooping in to capitalize on this reactionary freakout was the National Party, an amalgamation of Afrikaner, or white South Africans of Dutch ancestry nationalist parties. The National Party thought the liberal United Party was weak at handling the problem of black people living close to white people. Perish the thought. This is gonna sound ridiculous by present standards, but the National Party believed wealthy English South Africans were bringing in cheaper non-white laborers to edge them out of a job. Tale as old as time, it seems. 
The National Party campaigned on maintaining white supremacy. They vowed to create a complete legal regime formalizing a South Africa where white people reigned supreme. Non-white people were relegated legally to second, third, or as we'll see for black South Africans, fourth class citizens. And the racist platform worked. The United Party took a massive hit clearing the way for the National Party to come to power. The new government spared no time in making this horrific dream a reality. Over the next few years, they implemented one of the most disturbing sets of oppressive laws ever. The government instituted a four-tiered system, classifying people based on strict racial hierarchy. White people are at the top, followed by Indians and quote-unquote coloreds, which is a term for those of mixed racial heritage in the middle, and at the bottom were black people. The laws governing what these groups could and mostly couldn't do were collectively called Grand Apartheid. Grand Apartheid was basically one big ethnic cleansing and civil rights stripping campaign. Grand Apartheid began with the 1950 Racial Registration Act, which created the four-tiered racial classification system. How people were classified was based on ridiculous nonsense because race is a social construct and measuring it is fruitless. A notable example of using nonsense for racial categorization was the pencil test. If someone put a pencil in their hair and it fell out when they shook their head, they weren't considered black. Yeah, it's, it's that pathetic. It sounds like a thing a kid would come up at the last minute to enter into a eugenic science fair. The next significant law under Grand Apartheid was the Group Areas Act passed the same year. This banned mixed race living in a country where different races had lived side by side for centuries. The act set aside areas for different racial groups to live, ripping communities apart and leading to forced migration. Since there was a separate category for mixed race people, segregation meant many families were torn apart. For the record, the research I did for this video was full of euphemistic bloodless language to paper over the violent family separations and ethnic cleansing campaigns of people's own homelands. And for what? Anyway, the government also used an ID card for every adult with their racial classification listed and created boards tasked with classifying people based on their racial category. Think that's fucked up? Let's keep going. The South African government's idea was to create an independent state or Bantustan for each of the 20 ethnic groups they recognized. Then the government would force the indigenous people off their land and into these designated zones. The Bantustans were less countries than open air prisons to force black people into, declaring these their homelands, except for their actual homeland, which is you know, the, the whole country. These homelands represented about 13% of the total land area of South Africa, but way more than 13% of the population had to live on that land. The government tried to declare several Bantustans independent throughout the apartheid regime, and in doing so, stripped the inhabitants of their South African citizenship. This never worked out as the international community was pretty wise to what South Africa was up to and refused to recognize these new countries. Then, when people tried to escape these open air prisons, South Africa leveraged global discussions about illegal immigration to try and justify the brutal lengths they'd go to contain them. In the following decades, the government practiced forced removal, read ethnic cleansing, to resettle people into their designated non-prisons. They cleared slums, addressed overcrowding, which is rich considering how overcrowded the Bantu sands were, and incentivized landlords to get their black laborers to leave. Often, heavily armed police officers came in to force a region's inhabitants out of the area so that it could be bulldozed and turned into a white suburb. One place that met this fate was Sophia Town, a multiracial neighborhood and one of the few places in Johannesburg black people could live in and own land. Like many others, Sophia Town's residents were forcibly removed despite resistance and protest and sent to a new town called Soweto. Let's just, uh, Put a pin in the name Soweto. I have a feeling we're gonna hear that one again. And during all of this, it almost goes without saying, but if you were a woman, LGBTQ+, or had a disability, the oppression would be doubled, tripled, or even quadrupled. A subsequent law caused shanty towns to be bulldozed, forcing most residents out of the prosperous cities unless a white business owner agreed to pay for their housing. And even then, those black workers were often banned from having their families join them. The act also stripped voting rights from the few remaining black people who still had it. 
By the mid-50s, every non-white person had lost the right to vote. Black people had to carry their ID documents on them at all times, they couldn't own businesses in white areas, and they were banned from hiring a white person. Gotta keep that uh, hierarchy, you see. Interracial marriage was banned in 1949, but in 1950, we get into something that is called petty apartheid. We start with the Immorality Act, which made interracial sex a crime. Again, telling people who they can and can't love while separating families. In 1953, they passed the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act, which segregated municipal services like public transit, beaches, hospitals, and schools by race. I bet you can guess which services were better. Then there is the most insidious law. South Africa passed the Suppression of Communism Act, which made communism illegal, so much for the tolerant right, and allowed for the government to ban or suppress anything it deemed communist. From their perspective, communism meant anything critical of the government, and they interpreted this very liberally. In one case, colored poet Gladys Thomas had one of her books of poetry banned in her own country because of this law. Remember when studying history that when a country cracks down hard on communism, it's usually done to justify horrible, often racist acts. The US used it to deport Jewish Americans after the Palmer raids, and it was the basis of the Nazi ideology. Many Cold War era anti-communist movements were assembled to put right-wing dictators in power and use random violence to attack dissenters with impunity. I know, this video was never going to be monetized. Um, Patreon? As you can imagine, this mix of colonial domination, racial segregation, and literal ethnic cleansing is disastrous for the psyche. Post-colonial theorist Frantz Fanon wrote about the colonized mind in his 1952 book Black Skin, White Masks. While writing about his experiences, mostly in Martinique, but he traveled quite a bit, the principles he developed shed light into the factors at play during apartheid. Through white colonization, blackness was constructed out of many different nations and ethnicities. It's an identity created out of domination. It simplified an entire continent of cultures and ethnicities into one category based on nothing but skin color. With this created identity, whites could use violence and repression of education opportunities along with the erasure of indigenous culture to shape society around a created status as inferior. This social construct suppresses the imaginative space of the colonized, causing a split self-perception of what he calls the black subject. They struggle against an erased and colonized culture built to keep black people inferior. This feeling eventually becomes internalized. One way to struggle against this domination comes in creating what he called imaginative space. It's a mental fight against the colonization of the mind, as well as the body and land. And this imaginative suppression shows itself in various contexts, South Africa among them. Fanon's theory is similar to the writings of African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois wrote of a concept he called double consciousness, a generation before Fanon. He defined double consciousness in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, as a sense of always looking to oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. The conditions of colonization, the restrictions on education, the brutality of life under apartheid tried to prevent black academics and writers from developing and gaining prominence. For example, author Loretta Nkobo reported that she was unable to pursue her craft of creative writing while living in South Africa because of the conditions there. She lived in exile in several African countries before eventually moving to England, and only there was she able to start a meaningful writing craft. England gave me space. I began questioning what has been happening to me. I began questioning the politics. I began questioning everything. And I wanted answers. There was a feeling of being lost. And so when I was in England now, there was time, for instance, just a few months when I wasn't doing anything. I would stay at home, think, the children were in school, I'd think and write. I began writing like that. I had space. I had time. 
To think of apartheid as only a horrible program of displacement, brutalization, and inequality doesn't go far enough. The system oppressed the imagination, the minds, and the very identities of the people it subjugated. To know even a little of this system gives one the moral imperative to fight it with everything you had. And fight it, many people did. So let's talk about some of the people who fought to tear this structure down. The largest organization which became the face of the opposition was the African National Congress, or ANC. The ANC grew out of student movements and in 1949 became a national radical force for equality under elected executives Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela, and Oliver Tambo. It combined ideas of anti-colonialist African nationalism with Marxist thought. The leaders didn't see a path towards liberation from white oppression without mass movement and included developing a large, diverse coalition united to the cause. The ANC wanted victories using strikes, civil disobedience, and mass boycotts. And that's precisely what they tried to do. During the 50s, as the National Party pushed the programs that were based on apartheid, the ANC stood in defiance, resisting every step. A civil disobedience campaign in 1952 led to mass arrests for breaking curfew. Still, the government kept arresting and sentencing, all the while never budging on racial justice. Eventually, the lack of progress forced the ANC to back off the campaign. In 1955, they endorsed and helped create a Freedom Charter, which proposed a radically different South Africa without racial hierarchies. But the government dismissed the charter as socialism. Remember what I said about anti-communism? Just, just, just put it out there. A division in the resistance spawned a new group, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, or PAC. The PAC believed the ANC was too influenced by white communists. Their first project was to organize a protest in Sharpeville in 1960, a town founded upon the forced removal of 10,000 Africans from the town of Topville in 1943. The protest brought out massive crowds who defied the police by not carrying their pass cards. The police turned violent by firing into the crowd, killing 69 people and injuring 186. The police murdered many as they tried to flee, shooting them in the back. The reason they gave? One car was hit with a stone. In nightmare-inducing words, the police officer in charge claimed that, quote, if they do these things, they must learn their lesson the hard way. This event sparked movements across South Africa, causing the government to call a state of emergency. Today, this event's known as the Sharpville Massacre. In response to the police murdering peaceful protesters, the government declared the ANC and PAC illegal organizations. A cab! The Sharpeville Massacre prompted many anti-apartheid groups to begin a guerrilla armed struggle against the apartheid regime. The ANC established the Mkonto Wesizwe, or MK, as a militant wing of the group. The MK received training from the South African Communist Party and the promise of resources from the Soviet Union. Because this is the Cold War. Uh, the PAC started its own militant wing called the POCO, which was preparing for the more capital R revolution, while the MK focused primarily on sabotage. However, the PAC was short-lived and in 1962, after a mass arrest of PAC and POCO members, it further devolved into Maoist and reformist factions. After a massacre in Zaire, the name for Congo at the time, the group really never recovered. Furthermore, a raid on the MK headquarters in Liliesleaf led to the arrest of Nelson Mandela and 24 other ANC members in 1963. They were tried for treason, and the trial gained international attention as Nelson Mandela made his case to the world. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live for and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea 
for which I am prepared to die. He and the rest of those on trial received life imprisonments, and Nelson Mandela would not see freedom until 1990. The UN Security Council condemned the trial, which led to sanctions against South Africa. The ANC was on the back foot after this, but the world could no longer ignore what was happening. The ANC and the PAC were not the only resistance to apartheid, though. In the 1970s, a medical student by the name of Steve Biko helped grow South Africa's part of the Black Consciousness Movement, inspired by the Black Power Movement in America. It was a process of decolonizing the mind through Black pride and opposition to apartheid. The Black Consciousness Movement built a new appreciation of African custom and a move away from internalizing white supremacy. It included everything from addressing deep-seated feelings of inadequacy to a renewed appreciation of natural black hair and skin. The idea was to take this identity, construct it as a form of oppression, and remake it as a source of pride. And students kept being students and standing up for important causes. A 1974 law tried to enforce more Afrikaans education in black schools, forcing what Desmond Tutu called, quote, the language of the oppressor on indigenous Africans. In 1976, a middle school went on strike in the city of Soweto, Let's just uh, pull that pin out there, uh, which spread across the city. The students banded together to oppose the change. It was an intentionally peaceful protest, but as you know it, the police just wouldn't let that happen. They attacked the protesters with dogs and tear gas and eventually fired shots into the crowd. 23 people died on the first day, but the violence was just going to escalate and the protest became an uprising. By the end, the police had murdered nearly 200 people. From 1976 on, trade unions also joined the struggle against apartheid. Union officials were less likely to be arrested demonstrating so they could get into rooms and speak where student activists and armed rebels couldn't. They experienced a level of legitimacy many other movements didn't. It was the whiteness. Unions' roles in the struggle grew after the 1979 reforms legalized black trade unions. Massive union federations formed for the first time, many cross-racial, and by 1982, there were hundreds of strikes a year involving over 100,000 workers. By 1985, the strikes were so numerous that South Africa's government declared another state of emergency that lasted for four years. Labor shortages forced the government to open better employment opportunities and access to education up to black and Indian people. By the way, for the record, when your boss or conservative uncle tries to tell you that unions are bad, it's because they're terrified of working people exerting political power in exactly this fashion. Churches also played an important role in the struggle against apartheid. The pro-apartheid Dutch Reformed Church split on the issue of racial justice. A group of churches called the South African Council of Churches, or SACC, came out as a significant opponent of apartheid. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was also a big opponent to apartheid and was even arrested in 1988 for his work. Catholic schools began to admit black students in direct violation of apartheid law. And doubling down, they planned to do it with other institutions under their control like hospitals and orphanages. Even Pope John Paul II condemned apartheid and openly supported putting sanctions on South Africa. Along with anti-apartheid organizations, unions, and churches, a mass movement called the Mass Democratic Movement ran a short but successful campaign in 1989 to oppose the segregation of beaches, hospitals, and schools. I also want to make a small mention of the role that non-black allies played in the struggle against apartheid. While the majority of white people in South Africa supported apartheid, there were some who strongly opposed it. The United Party were the government opposition until the late 70s, and they opposed the most egregious forms of apartheid, though they opposed the Homeland Act because they, quote, didn't like how much land it was giving away. Ugh. Some white majority leftist groups like the South African Communist Party opposed apartheid, even, as you mentioned, helped train the ANC for guerrilla combat. Also, notable anti-apartheid activists came out of South Africa's Indian and Jewish communities. Not all of them opposed apartheid, but there was undoubtedly overrepresentation from these groups in non-black resistance to the regime. Specific women's groups also opposed the apartheid system, along with the feminist movements of the day. The apartheid regime came under scrutiny from much of the global community. Many nations condemned South Africa for the Sharpeville massacre, 
especially from the British Commonwealth of which they were a member. Rather than cave to calls for, you know, human rights, South Africa voted to become a republic and left the Commonwealth with severe economic consequences. Now, I support leaving the Commonwealth, don't get me wrong, but Queen. But leaving it because you'd rather go alone than abandon openly racist policies? Eh. The United Nations, and India especially, had been on South Africa's case about apartheid from the beginning. The ruthless crackdowns would stir up conversation, and South Africa became a regular topic of discussion at the UN General Assembly. After Sharpeville, the UN passed a resolution asking South Africa to pretty please stop running a violent racist regime. They even, and prepare yourselves here, began a committee to oppose apartheid. What came out was another resolution which banned member states from selling weapons and military supplies to the government using it to oppress their black majority population. That'll show them. There was a request to boycott, divest from, and sanction South Africa. You could almost call it a BDS movement. By the late 80s, this started to work. And where have I heard of boycotts, divestments, and sanctions before? Huh. Eh, who knows. Some countries stepped up to the plate more than most. Sweden comes to mind as an early and more than just token supporter of the ANC in the opposition to apartheid. But the West generally was ambivalent at best, and enemies to the struggle against the regime at worst. Perpetual villains of history, US President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher were outspoken allies of the government that was committing ethnic cleansing. Par for the course for them, actually. They opposed the growing international and even within their own borders efforts to isolate South Africa and force an end to this abomination of a government. It wasn't until 1989, a time me, this millennial talking to you now, was alive that the US did anything to condemn the apartheid government. And by this time, the apartheid regime was beginning to crumble on its own anyway. I just want to make sure these governments, while we're at it, bear the marks of shame for working with and supporting one of the most horrific governments in human history. At the same time, kudos to countries like Zambia, the USSR and Eastern Bloc, China, Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, Algeria, Libya, Tanzania, and Cuba which gave real aid to the struggle. Some, such as Cuba, even sent their own troops to fight with the ANC. And to hand deliver one special mark of shame, let's talk about South Africa's relationship with Israel. While South Africa grew more and more isolated for the atrocities they were committing on their people, Israel remained a staunch friend and ally. When the world refused to sell weapons to South Africa for oppressing black people, Israel was there to lend a helping small arms sale. South Africa and Israel even worked together to develop nuclear weapons with the help of the Swiss. Yeah, don't think I forgot about you guys. Isn't that sweet? I can't imagine why Israel would want to defend a country which brutalizes their indigenous population and pens them in open-air prisons as part of a decades-long ethnic cleansing program to ensure white supremacy reigns supreme in a colonized land. I can't imagine why they support that at all. Temperatures rose in the 80s as more and more movements joined a growing tide to bring about apartheid's end. But the state was not going to give up on it without a fight. South Africa doubled down on ballooning police and military budgets to suppress dissent, as well as invade neighboring countries to crush the ANC and their allies. By the late 80s, things had pretty much fallen apart. The state struggled to suppress seemingly endless uprisings in black townships, and during the 80s state of emergency, the prime minister ruled by decree and uh, let, allowed people to be arrested and detained without trial. They used this to imprison tens of thousands of dissidents. So are you going to explain the Justinian plague or not? Oh, oh yes, of course. I, I just need to finish this one thing. Listen, I give you a toonie and don't have a lot of time. I know, I know, it's just that my YouTube channel was recently wiped out by Dinesh D'Souza with the Infinity Gauntlet, so I need to learn how to do videos all over again. Luckily, though, I have Skillshare here to teach me video editing. Wait, are you... Tristan from Step Back History trying to rep my longtime sponsor, Skillshare? No, yes. did you just say your channel was wiped out by the Infinity Gauntlet, like from the Avengers movie? Well, no, because admitting the Avengers is a thing that exists would be like somebody calling a zombie a zombie in The Walking Dead. But did you ask about Skillshare, the learning community where millions come together to learn about subjects such as illustration, design, photography, video, or freelancing? No, can I have my Tony back? 
How about something more valuable than the tuning? I've been taking this course called Python 3, Programming in Python for Beginners by Arkartush Vudoshlov for a few months now, and you can watch it for two free months with the code in the description. Description? What are you talking about? You, you know what? Just, just keep the tuning. Uh, wait, though, I have a code right here. It's skill.sh slash... Wanted to make a quick aside to mention that the chief pushers of preserving apartheid was the mining industry. The apartheid regime benefited resource extraction industries, which, if you don't know, South Africa is loaded with. South Africa produces over three quarters of the world's platinum, 11% of the world's gold, is the third largest export of coal on Earth, and is also full of diamonds! So keeping a black underclass to work in these mines for next to nothing meant that the owners had a vested interest in maintaining apartheid. It also happens to be where Elon Musk sources his family's wealth from. Just, just so you know. I mention all this because, okay, I know you're going to be surprised by this. It all comes back to capitalism. Capitalism is a beast that uses anything it can to gain leverage and funnel more money to capitalists. And it exploits every social inequality and fault line to do so. While racism doesn't disappear without capitalism, as long as there's a buck to be made off of it, capitalism will make racism worse. No amount of nudge programs or tax incentives ever seem to make this go away. So like, abolish capitalism, but also don't be a class reductionist? Anyway. Let's return to the story. In the late 80s, it was finally in vogue to call out South Africa. Many different industries boycotted South Africa. Divesting from South African companies and trade sanctions were essential tactics that isolated South Africa to the point where it caved. They were forced to begin thinking about tearing down apartheid and negotiating with the ANC to end the resistance. Things improved slightly in the 80s, but real progress wasn't made until 1989 when Prime Minister B.W. Botha had a stroke and was forced to resign. His successor, F.W. de Klerk, defied expectations and pushed for actual changes. 1990, he lifted the ban on the ANC and PAC and repealed discriminatory laws. Not long after, he released Nelson Mandela from prison after nearly 30 years behind bars. This was followed by two years of negotiation between the government and the ANC. It was a hopeful but tense time. Negotiations had to strain against violent outbursts from the ANC's rivals and right-wing white supremacists. But they made progress. De Klerk and Mandela both got Nobel Peace Prizes in 1993 for their work, which, like, I know doesn't mean much because Kissinger, but hey, if I got one, I certainly wouldn't complain. Hashtag give Tristan Nobel Peace Prize. Negotiations culminated in the 1994 election, the first democratic election in South African history. It was a glorious moment of human progress, and the ANC ran as a political party and won the election hands down. The South African people elected Nelson Mandela as the first black leader of South Africa. The flag was changed to mark the end of apartheid, and South Africa celebrates the anniversary of this election to this day. Well, that was nice. I can end on a happy note for once. Wait, wait, why is that ominous music playing? No, no! It wouldn't be Step Back if I didn't ruin the good feelings with a bummer, now didn't I? Apartheid officially ended, but the ANC's rulership introduced many neoliberal reforms. It led to a steady increase in income inequality, and without massive land reform, it meant the white elites who ran the country before apartheid still dominated. Legal segregation might be gone, but unofficial segregation brought about by income levels and property values results in a highly segregated country still today. White South Africans still enjoy many privileges the black majority still don't, even if they're unofficial. Speaking of white South Africans, for what significant reforms were made, there was a backlash. In the years since apartheid's end, many white South Africans have left the country or wax nostalgic about the old apartheid days. One town named Oriana teaches a revisionist history which openly praises apartheid. For a while, about a year ago or so, not sure. We're living in a revolution within a pandemic, within a hell election between two rapists, like a matryoshka doll of history. So time is a myth. 
Anyway, sometime in the not-too-distant past, white supremacists and white nationalists in the country and abroad spread a conspiracy theory that white people were being targeted for genocide in South Africa. And all I gotta say to that is... Citation needed. So, South Africa's future is uncertain. And even with the apartheid regime gone, the scars of colonialism and racism run deep. There's still a lot of work to do. Hey, is this your first time here and you have an insatiable lust for videos that my hundreds of videos long back catalog can never hope to sate? Then subscribe and hit the bell notification to ride that pony the second it comes out. Thank you to my patrons and those who support the sponsor, and I'll see you all next time. Oh, and push the like button, I guess.